Amen. Um, I'm going to invite Teresa up to um, read the scripture today. We are doing Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 like we have. Only it's not out of the King James Version today like it says in the bulletin. It's actually um, New Living Translation. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Thank you for that. Um, I know we have been going through and reading the Ephesians um, 5, 1, and 2 every Sunday. And next Sunday will be our, well, not our last Sunday that we're going to be reading that scripture. Um, because our, our sermon series after that will continue on in that Ephesians 5, 1, and 2, how we are to be imitators of Christ. But I wanted us to read it every Sunday during this sermon series is just to remind us that we are called to live a life full, filled with love and to follow the examples of Christ, right? I can't really hear myself. Is everybody else okay hearing me or is it? I see a few no's. Okay. Okay, now I can hear it. <laughs> okay. So this week we are going to be in Ephesians 4, and we're going to be, as I said, discussing forgiveness. We're going to be discussing how we have received forgiveness, and it's something that we need to give back out. I know forgiveness is something we don't like to talk about. I mean, we like to talk about it when it's a receiving kind of thing, but we don't really like to talk about it when it's a we're supposed to give forgiveness kind of thing. Christ forgave us. Amen? Right? And we are called to forgive others. A few amens on that one. <laughs> a few. I was going to, I wrote in my notes, amen? Question mark. <laughs> How many am I going to get on that one? <laughs> so, right, this week we're going to go ahead and just jump right into the scripture and then we are going to um, dissect that a little bit into these three thoughts that we have. Ephesians 31 through 32 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. I mean, that seems pretty easy, right? I mean, we got this all down pat. We don't really need to hear another sermon on how we're, we need to be forgiving and compassionate and all that, right? We don't have any bitterness or rage or anger. Amen. <laughs> and, um, we are kind and compassionate and forgiving each other, right? Oh, seems pretty, as my children's kindergarten teacher would say, easy peasy, lemon squeezy, right? <laughs> seems pretty easy, right? Ugh. So, realizing that none of us have this down pat, we're going to unpack this, um, this, this passage into three different things. Paul talks about three different things in this passage. Getting rid of all forms of malice, Right? being kind and compassionate and forgiving each other, and that Christ forgave us. So let's start with the, the first one, getting a, rid of all, he calls us to get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. So I wanted to put this up on the screen just to give you guys the definitions of these things so that maybe we can see these definitions and go, okay, yeah, maybe. That's a little bit of what I have, or maybe this kind of 
fits me. And I don't want us to look at these definitions and go, yeah, that person has a bunch of bitterness. <laughs> that is not the reason we're putting these definitions up. This is an inward look. So let's read this. So bitterness, the definition of bitterness is an inner attitude of resentment, spite, unforgiveness, hatred, animosity, or harshness. Our second definition is rage, a passionate outburst of bottled up anger. And anger, the definition of that, is an inward seething of the emotion. The next word we have is brawling, a loud quarreling or angry shouting. I mean, none of us do that, right? <laughs> Anybody that has a spouse, you don't... You don't yell at them, right? Slander, abusive speech, cursing, or insults. And malice in this form just means like a badness or a troubled interpersonal relationship. Now, I kind of think that no matter who we are, we can kind of find something on that list that we might have a little bit of an issue with. Uh, spite, harshness, an inner attitude of resentment, unforgiveness. Anger, as we defined, is the inward seething of the emotion. Do we have that? Now, to kind of unpack this a little bit, I want us to jump back a few verses in Ephesians, back out to where Paul states in Ephesians 4.26, he says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Now, sometimes, I think that we separate that verse out. We go, do not let the sun go down while you are angry. And secondly, don't give the devil a foothold, right? Right? And so we kind of separate that verse out. We don't think that the two are linked, but it's one thing. Paul says, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry because that will give the devil a foothold. Being angry isn't the sin. It's what possibly we could do with that anger. That it could be the sin. Paul quotes in this Psalm 4.4. Um, it says, tremble. And in some versions it says, in your anger, do not sin. When you are on your bed, search your heart and be silent. It doesn't say, if you get angry, do not sin. It doesn't say, don't get angry. It isn't... The anger, anger is a natural human emotion that God gave us. It says that in your anger, do not sin. Paul goes on to explain that. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Don't hold on to the anger, because if you hold on to anger, there is a high probability that you are going to let Satan tempt you into sin. As we said, anger is defined as the inward seething of emotion. It could very easily lead to any of those that we just listed, the bitterness, rage, brawling, slander, malice. Anger infiltrates our heart. And as we've mentioned several times in the sermon series, Jesus told us it's out of the overflow of our heart that our mouth speaks. If we have anger within us, that's what we're going to reflect. And we're not going to be reflecting the image that we need to be. Anger could lead us to physically taking out our aggression. 
And those temptations we face by holding on to those inward seething emotions could be an act out upon our anger, possibly seeking vengeance, which we all know is not ours. A few verses after the one we spoke about in Romans last week, the Romans 9 or 12, 9, that love must be sincere, we spoke about, Paul says this, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Seeking vengeance is not our place. But we all too often seem to forget our place, right? I honestly feel like we don't truly understand how to avenge as humans. I think a lot of our humanness gets in the way. And that's why I think God told us, don't take revenge. I will avenge it. God knows how to properly do that. Because truly, if we are acting in accordance of God, if we are doing what God has called us to do, then when people come up against us, they're not coming up against us. They're coming up against God, right? I would argue that we don't know how to properly avenge in our humanness, and God tells us just don't because you don't even know how. And he tells us in plain words, don't take revenge. I seem to think we do it a lot. Sometimes it's through our words, uh, speaking negatively about someone and knowing that that's going to get around You have negative feelings towards someone, and so you're going to tell other people that you have these negative feelings towards them, and that they're going to have negative feelings towards them, and it just kind of goes from there. Sometimes it's, it's our heart attitude towards someone, and that shows in our heart. Sometimes it's our actions that we try to stage vengeance, right, for someone. And that truly speaks to our heart issue, not theirs. Many psychologists agree that anger is most easily dealt with in the early stages of its development. And we could hold on to it and have that inner seething emotion Or we can let go of it. And many times holding on to that anger clouds our judgment on a lot of things. The best way for us to deal with this anger is to take a breath, step away, take a moment to breathe instead of reacting immediately. We tend to want to react. We just want to lay it all out or lay them out, right? (laughs) Our anger flares, and when that happens, we need to take a hold of it. We tend to react out of our anger when our anger flares instead of out of compassion. When we allow ourselves to take that moment and to take a breath, oftentimes we might find What would have been our reaction would have been an over-the-top reaction to a minor offense. A lot of times we tend to bottle up our anger throughout the day, and then we have one thing that just sets us over the edge, and boom, that's when we go off, right? Right? In our anger, in our moments of anger, we tend to try to put ourselves in the position of the plaintiff, so the person that was wronged, the person that was hurt, and also in the position of the judge, right? And when I thought about that, I thought about 
our, our, our Romans Bible study that we did, and I thought about that commentary that William Greathouse had, had written over that, and he referred to Romans 3 as this courtroom scene. We stand condemned before the judge of the universe. And God is not only the judge, but he is also the injured party in this, right? He is the plaintiff in this. In Romans 3, 21, it says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Not only does God stand in the courtroom as the judge and as the plaintiff, the injured party, but beautifully enough, God stands beside us and is our advocate. That's what that passage says. God sent Jesus to be our advocate, to stand beside us and to plead our case. To show the beauty of that, this week God placed in my path this podcast randomly by Matthew West, who is a Christian artist, and he had this podcast on forgiveness, and I stumbled upon it, and there was this story that was, um, or the story of why he wrote the song Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Uh, if you've never heard that song, I'd look it up. Matthew West, Forgiveness. But the reason why he wrote this song was because he had heard this story, this tragic story told to him by Renee Napier, who lost her 20-year-old daughter, Megan Napier, in a tragic accident. And I won't tell her whole story. I will let her. We have a video of her story, and I'll go turn these lights out. mother of four. I have a son. At the, he's my oldest and then um, three daughters. The last two daughters that I had are twins so they're my babies and Megan is one of the twins. And um, my love for my children is immense. I just totally poured my life into my four children and the you know Megan was uh, just very joyful. She had a happy heart and brought a lot of humor into our family. And, um, you know, the love that she brought is, is just amazing. And, you know, the moment that I learned that I was not going to see her again um, was absolutely the most devastating moment of my life. And I had to survive some really, really dark days. It, it felt like someone had reached inside of me and pulled out all of my insides and just left me as an empty shell of a person. It was a Friday night and a, a buddy called me up and he wanted to go down to the beach to watch this band play and I thought it sounded like a great idea. 
And so we went down there and we, we had a couple drinks. You know, I never really thought that when I left the bar that night, two innocent lives would be taken. I mean, really, the worst I thought is I might get a DUI. But I was wrong. I mean, prison, prison's like hell on earth. I mean, it's a, it's a really dark place. It's somewhere where I never would have expected to land. You know, I was pursuing a college degree one minute, and then the next minute, I'm in prison for 22 years with a, a bunch of people who have lived a lifestyle of crime, uh, rapists, murderers, child molesters. And you know, when it got down to it, that wasn't even the worst part, being in prison. The worst part was, you know, the guilt that I had to live with for the rest of my life. The fact that Eric is the exact same age as my son made me think about him as a son and not necessarily as my own son, but I, I reflected on my son being that age and realized that my son could make that same decision because it is a choice. And as I thought through that, you know, I realized that he was a good person as I got to know his family and got to know things about him, that he's a really good person who just made a really bad choice. And because of that, two girls died and, you know, it's a horrible tragedy. Uh, and you cannot take back what happened. Me hating Eric forever is not going to bring Megan and Lisa back. And I just knew that it would be better for our healing and for moving forward to be able to forgive him and, um, you know, for his family as well, because his family's living with um, a horrible tragedy, you know, even though they're on the other side, they're affected by the grief and the sadness and the sorrow and maybe even shame. And I just felt like it would be better for everyone if we could all heal together. I really didn't feel like I deserved forgiveness, but it, I mean, it was such a blessing. It was, uh, it gave me the opportunity to actually to plan my future again, not to think about somebody hating me. And, and, and it, it, was, it was a total blessing. And you know, uh, Renee's forgiveness made me a really lucky person. I made one bad decision, and it's something I'm going to have to live with for the rest of my life. We have Kleenexes up here. I had to watch that video so many times in order not to be crying. So if anybody needs one, don't. I'm not going to think anything less of you if you need to come up and get one. I love how Renee said it. She stated, I feel like it would be better for everyone if we could all heal together. She recognized him as a human being, as God's creation, and recognize that there needed to be healing on both sides of that situation. And her forgiveness opened the door to that healing. What that video didn't state, that she did state in the podcast that I listened to, was during the trial, Eric was very unrepentant, pled not guilty, continued to act like he was not guilty of this crime that he had committed. He even wrote the family a letter, and she said it was an apology letter, but it wasn't really apologetic to his actions. During his sentencing um, trial, Renee was able to get up and to give a statement, a victim statement. And in the middle of that victim statement, she turned to Eric and said, I forgive you. What power in those words. 
to forgive someone that doesn't even seem to be taking the responsibility of their actions. But that opened the door. And he was able to move forward knowing that one of the people that he had hurt the most had forgiven him. And truly, it led him to a relationship with Jesus. Eric and Renee now go around the country giving speeches on forgiveness and drunk driving and how we need to forgive. How amazing is that? This beauty that God has brought out of this pain. C.S. Lewis, another quote that fell into my lap this week, <laughs> God put it there obviously, is said, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. As it said in the video at the end, they did not forget. Megan is still gone. But Renee realized that forgiveness was the only way forward. And that taught me, or made me think about this quote that I had read this week in my reading for my class. It is given by Harold Faw, who is the head of psychology, the psychology department in Trinity Western University in British Columbia. It's his book that I'm reading. But he said, once our anger has fully developed, forgiveness is the only way to res resolve it. This is not a natural human response. For our sinful nature and desire to get even runs deep. Nevertheless, for the sake of our relationships with others and our own psychological health, we really have no other good options. God has forgiven us, and he expects us to pass it on. Forgiveness is defined by psychologists as a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance towards a person or group who has harmed you, regardless of whether they actually deserve your forgiveness. And now, back to our verse for today. I want to go into verse 32. Paul said, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ forgave you. The experts, we'll call them that, the experts, the psychologists, the scientists on how our brain works, not the expert, right? <laughs> but the ones that tend to be here on earth that try to explain these things have found out that unforgiveness causes our bodies to release stress hormones. And a steady stream of those stress hormones can cause, um, you guessed it, stress, <laughs> anxiety, it can dampen our creativity and cause issues with our problem solving. Now the experts, the ones I spoke about before, have found out that forgiving gives us benefits. We have greater feelings of happiness, of hopefulness, and of optimism. Showing forgiveness shows that it reduces anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and lowers our blood pressure. Just so you know, I used to have an issue with my anger. I know, you probably look at me and go, what? No, you didn't. You can ask my family. I used to have an issue with my anger. Because that's what I saw, not necessarily in my parents, but in another family member that I had, was a lot of anger. And so I had issues with my anger. And all it took was I listened to this pastor on TV, and they said, you think you can't get your anger un under control? Okay, here you go. 
let's pretend like you are yelling at your kids or yelling at your husband and your pastor shows up at your door. You'll get that under qu real quick. So that proves to you that you can, in fact, <laughs> control your anger. I thought about that for a long time. Um, yeah, I think I could probably <laughs> stop yelling if the pastor showed up at my door. <laughs> and I know you may be saying to me, but Pastor Marcy, you just don't know what they did to me. I can't forgive them. And I will tell you that God doesn't call us to hold on to it because he knows that will only hurt us. I read once that an unforgiving attitude is like drinking poison, expecting the other person to die. I know that when we give our pain to God, beautiful things, much like Renee and Eric, can happen. I have watched it in my own life time and time again. Renee's story has, is just one of many, and they are changing lives. Her forgiveness changed Eric's life, and together they are showing that healing can happen through forgiveness. I read this week that forgiveness is what distinguishes Christianity from all other religions. Hmm. God calls us to imitate Jesus. And Jesus forgave. He gave his life to forgive. Jesus taught us that we should pray, forgive us our trespasses as though we forgive those who trespass against us. And I think there's a reason that that line is in the Lord's Prayer. Because maybe it's supposed to be a daily reminder to us that we are called to forgive as we have been forgiven. We need that daily reminder that we are called to forgive as we have been forgiven. To be like Christ, we are called to be holy, like we spoke about in this first um, lesson or this first sermon we had in this series. We are called to be relational or sincerely loving, like we spoke about last week. We are called to be forgiving, as we're speaking about this week. And we are called to be self-sacrificing, is what we'll speak on next week. To show God's love forgiving us. This is that amazing grace we sing about, that has been extended to us. And we are called to extend that beyond ourselves. Jesus tells us in Matthew uh, 6, verses 9 through 15, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on it, earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For, um, for, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now that's heavy. If we choose not to forgive, the Father will not forgive us. I know it's not in our nature to forgive, our human nature to forgive but we are called to put off our old selves and to walk into this new life that we are given through Christ. We are 
called to act contrary to how we feel we should act. In a minute, we are going to sing, I surrender all. And we are called to surrender our all. In that, we surrender our old selves. We surrender the right for vengeance, right? The right to get even. We surrender the anger that we feel. We surrender the bitterness. We surrender the rage. We surrender the anger. We surrender the brawling. We surrender the slander. We surrender the malice. And we embrace that we are called to be kind and compassionate. And we embrace that we are called to be forgiving as much as we embrace that we have been forgiven. As I said, we're going to sing our closing song is I Surrender All. But as we're singing, I want us to really search our hearts. Really search our hearts and see if, in fact, we have absolutely surrendered all that we have to surrender. Let us pray and then we'll sing that song. Lord, I pray that you open our eyes to your creation. That we can see it clearly and that it's not overshadowed by our own unforgiveness. I pray we see what your mercy sees and for you to teach us to extend grace to others as grace has been extended to us. And Lord, remind us that grace is something that is freely given and not earned. Lord, I pray that we see creation as you see it. That we are moved to compassion for others, not moved towards anger. And when we are moved towards anger, Lord, that you remind us that in our anger, we cannot sin. We have that feeling and we give it, we give it away immediately to you. That we can react out of compassion, not out of anger, to others. Lord, I pray that you work on the areas. Show us the areas that we have not forgiven others in. Lord, I pray that you, that you help us mold that and make that and give that forgiveness. Because I know that when we give that unforgiveness over to you, when we forgive, even those we don't feel deserve our forgiveness, that beautiful things can be done. That you will take that pain and do beautiful things with it. Lord, I pray that you just continue to guide our hearts. Continue to open up our hearts and our minds to what it is that you're teaching us. Lord, I pray as a church that we be forgiving. Lord, I want to show that to the community, how we forgive, that we love sincerely, and that we forgive. Lord, we need your help with that. Lord, I just pray that you Search our hearts today. You search us and know us. Point to any areas of unforgiveness that we may have so that we can take care of that, so that we can give that to you. 
if we have anger, that if we have any of those things, you point that out to us and show us how to live this new life, to not get caught up in our old life again. Teach us how to be done with our anger so that we don't give Satan a foothold in our life that leads to sin. Lord, I just pray that you just continue to search us, continue to point it out to us this week. Lord, as we pray, as we sing this song, I surrender all. Lord, I just pray that if there's any part of our lives that we have not surrendered to you, that you show that to us. Lord, we just love you and we praise you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.